speaker, uh, Dr. Ivor Van Heerden. Um, he's uh, uh, living in Reedville now, but uh, he did uh, live in Louisiana, and he was uh, played a key role in um, finding out what happened during Katrina and why why it, it, it flooded as much as it did. Um, but anyway, he received his undergraduate degree from the University of uh, Natal in South Africa and a graduate, a graduate degree from LSU. And he led the state Louisiana official forensics team that investigated the levee failures and has testified before a number of congressional committees about the causes of the catastrophe. Um, uh, since then, he has undertaken thousands of interviews and appeared in many documentaries, including uh, Harry Shear's uh, The Big Easy um, and a number of other um, activities. Okay, without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to Dr. Van Heerden. Thank you. Um, just by way of setting this up, what is somebody from Louisiana doing in Reedville? Uh, well, we found this place by boat, by sailboat. So we liked it so much, we eventually moved here from Louisiana. Um, by way of background, uh, I did my, un, un, my graduate degrees at LSU, and um, then I left and went back to Southern Africa, where I was born and grew up. I ended up in the Caribbean, again on a sailboat, and um, worked there for NOAA on the National Underwater Research uh, Lab. And then uh, was invited, in essence, back to LSU to set up a research program looking at coastal restoration. And within uh, two years, I was appointed by the governor of Louisiana, the then governor, uh, to run the state's coastal restoration program. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But basically, there was an effort underway with state and federal dollars to try and restore the coast. And I had presented them with the first plan um, on how to do that. But it, what I realized, and I'd realized this with my graduate studies, but during this time, was that uh, Louisiana was totally unprepared for a major hurricane. And that uh, it, in their planning efforts, uh, emergency management issue, uh, uh, training, etc., they weren't taking into account the fact uh, that a million acres of wetlands had been lost since the 1930s. And that and this, these wetlands that absorb the wind energy and, uh, and knock down the surge and reduce the waves um, weren't there. And so the impacts were going to be far worse. And I used to hear these anecdotal stories or people would tell me, oh, if a hurricane came up the Mississippi, it would sink New Orleans. And there was always somebody from New Orleans who was telling me that, but it was kind of like, well, so what? Um, so uh, once I got out of the coastal restoration program, I, I realized that uh, there wasn't the will, the political will really in Louisiana to restore the coast, and there wasn't enough money. And so uh, if we can't get the coast restored, the next best thing for me as a scientist is to try and prepare them. And along the way, this little, uh, little still voice kept uh, popping up in my head, telling me New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans. Um, I was very fortunate I got invited to, uh, to Honduras uh, by the president of Honduras to help uh, in their recovery after Hurricane Mitch. And along with, uh, with me came, uh, was, an, was a wind engineer from LSU. Mark Levitan, and between him we came up, between us, we came up with the idea to create a hurricane center at LSU, and then that gave us the, the pathway to go out, and I then secured, uh, uh, by the end of it all, $5 million to study New Orleans. So uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to develop a, um, a storm surge model, uh, something far more uh, superior to what NOAA and everybody else was using, and we eventually adapted a model called AdCERC, and this has now become the prime uh, storm surge model in many parts of the country and overseas, including the Netherlands. Uh, they basically took what we developed and they're now using it everywhere. But I needed to know what the surge was gonna be so I could understand how much flooding, were the levees high enough, what were the dynamics, what was gonna stir this whole thing up. Um, so we were given money to to, to fund a, uh, to set up a public health research center. And so I had a team of 
scientists, veterinarians, uh, doctors, epidemiologists, uh, landscape architects, you name it, uh, they got together, and uh, computer modelers um, from uh, the uh, University of Notre Dame to work with our modelers. And uh, so we started to study it in New Orleans. And that included doing um, uh, public opinion surveys. And you can imagine in a city where uh, at that time 128,000 people didn't own motor vehicles, 220,000 people didn't have phones. How do you do a phone survey? And so we would actually have to go in and give phones to people and with enough money on them and ask them to do the survey and then they'd have a, have a phone. And that was to try and capture the full population. And what we realized at that time was that only 68% of uh, the 1.1 million people living in New Orleans at that, that time would evacuate if a major storm came. And that was starting uh, in uh, 2000, 2001. So we knew we really needed to get as much information out and we needed to convince uh, the state and the federal government um, you know, how severe the situation could be. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then uh, the state of Louisiana asked me uh, to set up a forensic investigation team to, to uh, study the levy um, failures. Um, so, and we were the first guys to announce to the world that this was a catastrophic structural failure, um, and so on and so on. And the ultimate end of the story, and probably one of the reasons we're in Reedville, is that LSU decided to fire me for, for my pain, for for doing this. So um, here we are. Uh, so what's wrong with Louisiana? Why does it flood? It floods from storm surges, it floods from the river, and basically we need to understand a little bit about the geology, how it was formed. And the state Louisiana was formed, if you can see my cursor, maybe easy if I step over here. Can you hear me all right? Just oh, yeah. So, so the Mississippi River changes its course with time. It basically builds a course out to the sea. It gets much longer than a, the potential of a shorter course, and so it jumps into the shorter course. And in this way, about once every 1,000 years, it's built the coastal plain. And this is very, very soft sediment. It's marine sediments, uh, and they have very high water contents. And so with time, they compact. And as they compact, uh, the the surface sinks. So we have a big subsidence rate. The subsidence rate in Louisiana is twice that of um, Virginia. This, this system was self-maintaining um, when, when white man first arrived because there was the main river and there were a number of distributaries. The river used to overflow its banks for about 90 days a year in, the, in, store, in, in uh, river floods. So you spread the sediment and the fresh water, the goodness of the river, over a very wide area. So the wetlands were basically stable. But then man came along and built the levees along the river, the big flood levees that you see if you go down to the French Quarter around New Orleans, and cut off all these distributaries. So the man came along and cut off the sediment supply to the wetlands. And the net result is the wetlands started to uh, lose base, couldn't maintain their elevation, they weren't getting nutrients, and they started uh, to, to collapse. And so by, uh, from 1930 to the present, there's been over a million acres of wetland loss. Very, very significant. Tied to that has been the development of the oil and gas industry. So this is the coast of Louisiana. You can see New Orleans, the mouth of the river's down here. And these are only the major pipelines coming from out in the Gulf of Mexico. We see how they cut through the wetlands. So now you're cutting these pipeline canals and access canals all the way through the wetlands. In addition, uh, and that's just the, the major rigs that are out there, and those are the, the wells in Louisiana. So that coastal, that whole coast has just been chopped up with navigation canals, pipeline canals, access canals, you name it. And they totally changed the natural hydrology. So about 50% of the loss in Louisiana is the direct impacts of oil and gas and, and navigation. But the bottom line is you've lost the protection. Now this is a map that was first produced 
1994, and uh, it was trying to uh, come up with a prediction of where the coast would be uh, at uh, 2040. And we've now had to move it forward to 20, 2030, and it, uh, this may actually be an overestimation of what would be left. What you see in red is gone. And you'll notice it's bound by straight lines. And those are either existing or proposed levy systems. So, so not too di distant, in the not too distant future, there won't be any wetlands in Louisiana. Now, if you look at this feature here, there's a levy there, there's a levy there. It creates a huge funnel. And there are various funnels elsewhere. And these are, are absolutely deadly because as the surge goes up that funnel, it gets amplified. So New Orleans is living on, even though they've restored the, uh, repaired the levees, the, the, most of coastal Louisiana is living on borrowed time. Now you saw all those oil and gas facilities, or those are in, in uh, jeopardy of a major storm. And in fact, uh, the old FX channel did a movie called the Oil Storm, where they looked at what the impacts would, would be of a major storm impacting Louisiana. So, so this is a situation that is going to get worse with time. Now, for those who, who, who wonder why is the storm surge in Louisiana so bad compared to, say, here, the difference is our shelf, once we get outside of Chesapeake Bay, drops off pretty rapidly. The Louisiana, the continental sh shelf, is very, very wide and very low. And that situation amplifies any wind-driven water. So the hurricanes push the water towards the shore, it builds up, and that's why we can have surges in Louisiana of up to 36 feet. Now, in 1994, um, once I got out of working for the governor, that's when we started to talk about the what-if scenario. What would happen? What would happen? And as I mentioned, we eventually got the funding. Now, this is uh, something called LIDAR, and it's uh, using lasers, and we can get very accurate depictions of the topography or the elevations. And you can see that New Orleans is bound by levee systems, the dark blue being that part of New Orleans is, that's below sea level. And the other, uh, the greens and the browns are that part of New Orleans that are, that's above sea level. And because these are such squishy soils, as soon as you put a levee around them, which they did to develop these areas, you cut off the sediment supply, you start draining them, oxygen gets into the soil, and what happens is the plant material decomposes, the soil's 80% plant material, so it subsides. So the situation in Louisiana has been created uh, in terms of the low-lying land by the uh, development of the levee systems. Now this is a slide from 1999 when we first got started. And this is what we were predicting, this is what we were trying to sell. That a storm like, uh, such as Katrina would be a, a, a catastrophe. These were the impacts that we initially predicted. And 14 to 17 feet of water, no power, transportation, the pumps won't work, people stranded in the city. Petrochemical hazard materials released, overcrowding and severe economic impact, and over a million evacuees. And this all proved true. That is what happened um, during Katrina. Now eventually we got the state on board. There was a guy, Colonel Mike Brown, and he really started to believe in what we were doing. And uh, he managed to convince FEMA that uh, FEMA needed to run an exercise. And this was known as the Hurricane Pam exercise, and it took place uh, a, a year before Katrina, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. But what I want to show you is I'm gonna run the model, and this is a storm not too dissimilar from Katrina. It's just on uh, a slightly different track. So I'm gonna point out, this is the Mississippi River, New Orleans, Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Bourne, and the arrows indicate the wind strength. They call them vectors. So I'm gonna run it a few more times. But what you see is from this storm, coming in at category three on a track that goes like this, Katrina's track went like that, it totally floods the city, not from levee failures, just because all the levees are too low. 
So um, let me restart that. I want to stop it at a point. The brighter the color, the deeper the water, the, the higher the water is above the land. And you can see there's a dome of water developing right here. And this is against the artificial levees that protect everybody from the river. They become dams. And during Hurricane Katrina, the eye made landfall just where this eye is going to make landfall. And it carried on. And it picked up this dome and drove this dome into Mississippi. So at least 30% of the surge, remember Waveland and Gulf Shores and all these places that got wiped out in Mississippi, 30% of that water was Louisiana's fault from these levees. We've run the model without the levees and so we now know. So, so the, the problem is this, the management of this whole coastal system has been done piecemeal and never looked at for every action there's a reaction and what we do in one place could adversely affect another. Now, we ran the model a few other times, and our governor at the time lived about what we see, 85 knots. So I ran the model, so it would go right over her home. And what I wanted her to see is that she would have 14 feet of water in her home, even though she considered herself safe, that the interstate system would have gone underwater, and if you look down here in New Orleans, the part of New Orleans that's south of the river, so-called West Bank, went underwater. And this is a storm that's almost 50 miles away. And what we were trying to show is just how super susceptible Louisiana was to something. And then, of course, along comes Hurricane Katrina. By this time, we now have been brought into the State Emergency Operations Center, and I have a table at the, a seat at the table, and we're running our storm surge models, and we predict, we, we're passing on the information. And this was the first model run that we put out. It was on the Saturday, landfall on Monday. And we showed that there was going to be flooding in New Orleans because the levees were too low. And the fire chiefs, who we, we, we brought the fire chiefs into our, our, our center. The fire chiefs then made uh, copies of this, put them in Ziploc bags, and sent their, their fire crews out and started pulling people out of the areas, the elderly, where you see the dark blue. So that was the initial rescue, if you will. We worked very closely with the media. Um, and so we put uh, the, the local newspaper had a big story. We had been watching the car count numbers, and they were very low until the Sunday morning paper came out, and this was on. And suddenly we saw those car count numbers starting to really climb because we were really we were deadly afraid that a lot of people weren't going to leave. Um, our storm surge model, I had put on a web page. Uh, CNN especially picked up the storm surge model um, and uh, uh, put it on the air, as, as did a lot, a lot of local television stations. So if you think about Katrina, as I mentioned before, it misses New Orleans. You can see in New Orleans, there's about 70 mile an hour winds. So New Orleans actually was missed by Katrina. The worst side of any hurricane is on the right side because the winds are blowing ashore and that's where you get the forward movement plus the wind, they add it to each other and they increase the surge. So it was actually on the weak side. And I'm going to run the model and uh, show you a couple of things. Just watch this area. You're going to see the colors brighten up and then get injected into the city. Bang. And what we're looking at is a man-made canal called the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, Mr. Go. So it was a project that was put out to, that was supposed to shorten the course for shipping to get into uh, the port of New Orleans. It was a project that never worked. We, the taxpayer, ended up paying uh, $11,000 for every ship that came up this canal. 
And the problem was it went through the wetlands, it wasn't properly maintained, and it kept filling up with sediment. So they kept digging it deeper. And as the Dutch said, why would you create a system with a knife pointing at your heart? So, Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Bourne, the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, the Lower Ninth Ward we heard so much about. It's over here, 17th Orleans and London Avenue canals. I'm going to go through some of those. That's the model run that was uh, put up by uh, CNN that we gave to them. And anybody else who wanted it. Now, this is what it looked like afterwards. This is the first satellite imagery. And uh, we got crews in uh, immediately and we wanted to know what the water levels were. And you can see are these three different bowls or basins, the water levels were very different. So that immediately told you that what happened in that basin was different to what happened to the next one. And in fact, this area, St. Bernard Parish, is above sea level. And it got the worst flooding. 98% of all buildings were destroyed. In this area, it, the ground is minus six, six feet below sea level, so the water got to one and a half feet below sea level. Now, As I mentioned, I was tasked by the governor to do this forensic investigation through something called Team Louisiana. And um, I had spent some time, a, a, a number of visits to the Netherlands, and so I managed to convince the Dutch to get involved um, in some aspects. And this was a model that they produced showing the flooding of the greater part of New Orleans. And the French court is here. And you can see this is, there's a clock over there, so it's one, two o'clock in the afternoon. You can see the water's backing up behind some high land. So that people in this area were totally unaware. That's why you had uh, reporters down in the, in the French quarter saying, we've dodged the bullet. It was only in the late afternoon, evening, that that water started to come over those, that levee. And you'll see how fast it's moving. And that's why we had reports of white water rapids on Canal Street. So, so just as you look at this, imagine this is about 800,000 people. Well, in this area, say 600,000 people. And <clears throat> when it was over, most of those homes were worthless. Now what I try and tell audiences, I say, when you go home tonight and sit in your den, try and imagine that tomorrow morning, your parents, if you're a child, your parents don't have a job anymore, you don't have a home anymore, your cars are completely flooded, your house is completely flooded, how would you feel? And the, obviously the suicide rate went up very quickly because amongst uh, older men. And this, was, uh, this is just the, the major half of the city. I'll show you something for St. Bernard. But just try and imagine what we realized very early on in this process, because the media were hounding me. I couldn't go anywhere without media on my tail. They try and camp on campus. So if I went to the emergency operations center, I'd have dodged them. They wanted to come in the field with us, so we dodged, because we were the only ones who had any science. Nobody else had any science. You know, they were asking questions. How bad is the water going to be? We could tell them what was going to be in, in the water, what contamination. We could warn about um, the staph infections that were, that were almost a plague among some of the, the people who got injured. And um, uh, the media then uh, started asking questions. What went wrong? What went wrong? And I went to the governor and I said to her, uh, this was on Tuesday, landfall on Monday, I went to her and I said, um, I don't believe the water was high enough to overtop the levees in many locations. And she said, why? And I said, because our models, we believe, are so good, we believe we were accurate to maybe 5% at worst. And she said, go find out. I was very lucky. We managed to get civil air patrol uh, airplanes and we started flying. And the first flight I did 
I found 28 breaches. At that time, they were only talking about one on the 17th Street Canal. And the US Army Corps of Engineers and their spin was saying it was an act of God. Ours are, these are grade one levies, class one levies. There's no ways they could have failed. And I was saying the water didn't get high. So I went, I made a video. I came home late that night. I made a video and I took it to the governor. I said, there you are. That's, what we, that's what's out there. And of course, at this time now, it's, a, it's frantic. Things are going crazy. You've got all these people in New Orleans. Nobody's doing any rescues. Very few rescues. You've got some locals trying to do help. It was, it was a shambles. And part of it was because FEMA was non-existent. <clears throat> FEMA had one guy in New Orleans. And then the president did his flyover on Wednesday in uh, Air Force One, and that shut down the rescues. You're not allowed to have an aircraft in the air one. You know, so I mean, we're going frantic. And then they came on the air and said, I mean, the president announced there's absolutely no way we could have known about this. And I mentioned in one interview the Hurricane Pam exercise, you know. I briefed the White House staff. I spent 15 minutes with White House staff. I gave them a presentation. And Tim Russert, who used to uh, be on uh, Meet the Press, phoned me and said, Ivor, will you please fly to Washington? So Lori and I, my wife and I, flew up to Washington, and that's when we presented the Hurricane Pam and showed that the federal government actually knew that this was going to happen. So this was a man-made catastrophe with a hurricane as a trigger. So how did we get there? I've spoken about the loss of wetlands and the oil and gas canal. We had a similar storm in 1965. Only 75 people uh, drowned and very little uh, infrastructure damage. It was known as Hurricane Betsy. And at that time, Congress jumped into gear and came up with the 1965 Flood Control Act, which called for uh, building hurricane levees for New York. In addition, I've spoken to Mr. Go, the funnel. We call it the Hurricane Alley. But as we started to dig into the levee system, we found many problems with the science and many problems with the design. Now, in setting up my team, this is a shot of Hurricane Betsy. Looks just like New Orleans, but I mean New Orleans and Katrina, except black and white picture. Uh, this is the lower line. So, so Congress said, and this is from, from the Act, design and build levees for the most severe meteorological conditions re considered reasonably characteristic. And this was after Hurricane Betsy, a Category 4 storm. So everybody assumed they were going to be building to a Category 4 storm. And the Corps of Engineers, being the nation's engineers, were given the job. So as we started to go through this, we realized the first flaw, the first strike, if you will, was that all the, bay, the designs were based on a definition of a hurricane developed in 1959. We're now talking about the 70s. Many of the levees were only designed and built in the 80s. And that was for a windstorm with a 100 mile an hour wind. Now, Hurricane Betsy was a Category 4 reasonably. You know. We'd had uh, another Category 5 storm going to Mississippi just uh, four years after Hurricane Betsy. As we were going through the literature, we realized that, that SPH, that Standard Project Hurricane, the definition of being revised in 1979 to a Category 4 storm. And, uh, and the Corps of Engineers in New Orleans was ordered to use that Category 4 storm in their design. But they stayed with the 1959 definition of a standard project paradigm. Now what does it mean? I'm take you back to high school. Energy E equals C, the velocity squared times the max. So if you go from 2 miles an hour to 4 miles an hour, you're going to go, you double the wind speed, but you're going to quadruple. Okay. So, so when we looked at their designs, instead of building many of the levees 14 feet high, they were 40% off, they built them at 10 feet. 
The other thing they did was, when, when you do engineering, you all work from the same datum, the same level. And the prime reason is, when I pour my, my flush my toilet, it, you don't want it coming out of your house because we've got the elevations. We don't understand the elevation. So you've got mean sea level, and then you've got the datum zero. And the Corps of Engineers equated those. But in Louisiana, because of subsidence, they were one and a half feet different. So we ended up, instead of levees being 15 and a half feet, they were built at 10 feet. So, so, I mean, there were some fundamentals in the design. Now, the Corps of Engineers had helped fund and develop the slosh model, which is the model that the National Hurricane Center still uses today. And this is an output from 1979 that shows 13 feet of water in the French Quarter because the levees are too low. So they ignored the science. Now, what were the levees like? Well, originally, the locals had built, built earthen embankments. They'd dig a canal and pile the soil up, and that was their levee. And that, you know, they worked for a while. And then uh, everything subsided, lost elevation. So they came in and they hammered interlocking steel plates, sheet piled, into, this, into the earthen embankment as an attempt to raise it. And then the Corps of Engineers came and said, OK, we're going to attach concrete monoliths to the sheet pile. And that's how we're going to raise them. And they look pretty. But the crucial thing is, when this thing is full of water, is there enough strength in this system? Does this sheet pile give enough anchoring? Is there enough soil on either side, the meat, to keep this thing stable? And you end up with something called a factor of safety. So if you've got... 100 pushing this way, you want 100 to be keeping it up, and that would give you a factor safety of 1.0. Now, in South Africa, where I did my initial engineering, we worked on a factor safety of 3. The Dutch worked with a factor safety of 3 to 5. The British with a factor safety of 5. So, in New Orleans, they were working with a factor safety of 1.2. Very close to the edge. Now, when you looked at the 17th Street Canal breach, and I'll go take you through the 17th Street, the London Avenue ones, and then over here in the Lower Ninth. And we'll start with the Lower Ninth. And I'll show you, it's very plain what's going on. This is a picture taken that I took of the Lower Ninth Ward very shortly after the storm. And you'll notice all the houses here. Here's the levee breach, and I hope you can see all the houses are gone. And if you look over here, the houses all kinds of angles. When this levee let go, uh, the water was 17 feet above sea level. It was like a tsunami wave coming through. There. This is where most of the people died. There was just no escape. Because when I flew, what I was looking for, I was looking at the roofs, and I was trying to see if there was anything on the roof, what we call rack. Bits of cars, planks, boats, whatever, and it was all on the roof. And that told us that the water level had been so high that people had gone into attics. And that's where many of the bodies were found, in the attics. So when you went down on the ground and you started to look at, this, at the levee, behind it, there was a scour trench. You know, the water came over like a waterfall and it scoured it out. And what we could calculate is that once that trench got three feet deep, the system would fail. And there were two major failures on this wall, as well as um, about three failures that nearly happened. And this is what you'd see. The water came through this way. Here's the sheet pile. It was only 10 feet deep. And the canal here is 40 feet. One of the other reasons you have sheet pile is to stop water under pressure from piping under the levee system. So you were getting water coming underneath. We call them rat holes with blowouts amongst the houses. We could find those. And this thing just collapsed back. And I, some of the survivors I spoke to said you could hear the bang when that wall broke. At 17th Street Canal, what you saw was the wall had slid. It just slid 17, about 45 feet. Some of it had disappeared. If you were on the ground looking in a boat, 
This is the wall. We're looking down the wall here, and this is the boat. And here's a remnant of the wall. When we did the calculations, the factor of safety on this thing was less than one. And what we found out was when the contractor built this, the Corps of Engineers allowed him to shave some of the soil away on both sides for access. And they never redid their calculations. So this was actually just waiting to fail. When you went to London, uh, London Avenue, there were two breaches. And what I noticed, the walls had, had shifted, but also there were big holes. There were big holes behind the walls. So what was going on? This is uh, the second uh, thing. And this blowout, this was about 30 feet deep. We took a piece of string and an old nut, and we threw it in there. And that's how we knew how deep it was. The bags were how they uh, tried to seal the breaches so they could pump all the water out of the city. And when you looked around the houses, there was just tons and tons of white beach sand. Interesting, these people, this family got split up. One half were rescued through that hole in the ceiling and the roof, the other half through there. So, back of the envelope. You know, we now know that this system is sitting on top of 50 feet of sand. When the Corps of Engineers put the sheet pile in, it didn't even get into the sand. Okay. They used techniques developed by the British in 1905 to determine if seepage would occur. And that, those techniques, they're very easy to do. Uh, no calculus, very easy to do, but they for dams. And they totally ignored the sand. So if you just did simple, on the top of the sand, with the surge at 10 and a half feet, the pressure here is 1,280 pounds per square foot. Now sand is, you know, we all drink, drink groundwater here. Well, we got groundwater because we got sand. We've got good, good, porous gravels and sand. Well, that pressure is then transferred under the levee and it wants to blow out on the landward side. And the weight of the soil is, that, is supposed to balance it. Well, the weight of the soil was 660 pounds per square foot. So this basically had a factor of safety of 0 0.5. It was designed to fail. This is uh, what some of the levees look like today. Look at it. It's sinking under its own weight. This is one of my former students. You can see this concrete apron is cracked. It's actually bulging upwards. Here it's looking, maybe you can see it's dipping down. It's sinking, and he's looking at a gap that's that wide between the two concrete monoliths. Somebody had come and jammed a two by four on the hole. After Hurricane Gustav, the Corps of Engineers, you know, said we repaired it all, and this is what happened after Hurricane Gustav. In this area here, close to the lower ninth wall, the wall sank about nine inches during the storm. Now millions and billions of our dollars have been spent trying to correct some of these mistakes, which should have been, never have occurred. Now I spoke about the knife thrust into the heart, as the Dutch referred to the Mr. Go. And so, some lawyers decided to try and sue because you know, there were about 400,000 families that lost everything. So these lawyers got together from Louisiana, New York, California, and said, okay, well, let's try and uh, let's get together and see if we can sue the federal government for relief. And what the federal government, what came out of the courts was, uh, with the initial filings, was that you cannot sue the federal government if a levy fails. But at that time, uh, the ru ruling from the appeals court was you can sue the federal government if a navigation channel contributes to the flooding. So um, the lawyers contacted myself and asked me um, if I would be willing to be an expert witness. And uh, by this time, I was having a lot of pressure from LSU, a lot of pressure. And uh, so I said to them, you better go talk to LSU. And uh, 
Sean O'Keefe, the former NASA administrator, was the chancellor of LSU at the time. And we actually have the email where he says, if I ever testifies, he's going to be fired. And it was crucial that I kept my job because we were still doing a lot of, uh, lot of research. So the lawyers then approached me and said, uh, OK, we need some experts. And I said, well, we're going to have to, uh, you know, we're going to have to go knock on doors. And we couldn't find any in the United States. Nobody wanted to go against the Corps of Engineers. So I went to the Netherlands, kept in hand, put my hold in the, finger in their hold in their levy and said, please. And they graciously agreed to come and work with us. So the, we got the Dutch involved to help uh, do a lot of the modeling. So we wanted to look at the Mr. Go. The first thing was, if you looked at the levees, you could see, uh, you know, in the top of the photograph, they are gone. But there was this, like, washed area in front that suggested that waves may have been a lot more important. And then we started seeing this sort of structure on some of the levees. And that's very indicative of wave uh, scar. And then this crenulated form with the, you can see the beach that was scoured out in front of the levees and then the blowouts. When you added up all the levees that had failed in Katrina, it was 175 miles. There are 350 miles of levees, so over half the levees failed during Katrina. So the key thing was, had the Corps of Engineers maintained this canal to its original design, which they had. It was originally 650 feet wide, by the time Katrina came, the canal, and we're just looking at a segment opposite Lake Bourne, was 3,000 feet wide. So the judge basically said, I want you to do wave modeling and surge modeling as if the canal had never been built. Now, this canal brought in a lot of salt water, so it killed a lot of wetlands. So we had to add in the wetlands. There was an enormous amount of, of research. And so we looked at the situation. What were the waves against the levees in the Mr. Gosen situation? Now, there was no data. There were no, no instruments out there. Most of it was in the dark. So what we could see is that there was about a nine-foot wave impacting the levees during Katrina. With no Mr. Go, the waves then dropped down to about five feet. Okay. So, the next test became, would the levees have survived? And, uh, and we did in intensive studies with uh, Bob, uh, Dr. Bob B. from the um, University of California, Berkeley, the only university in the United States that didn't seem to worry about the Corps of Engineers. And, um, and what we could show was, if there had been no Mr. Go, the levees wouldn't have failed. The next thing he wanted to know, the judge, was how much of the water they got into New Orleans was from, from uh, the result of building Mr. Go. So what you can do here, this is looking at water level over time as the surge comes through. And you can see at this area, which is at the 17th Street, I mean at uh, the lower 9th Ward, we got about uh, 17 and a half feet of surge. Now when we modeled it with no Mr. Go, we only ended up with about 14 and a half feet. So there would have been water going over the levees, but not enough and not a long enough duration for the levees to have failed. Also, you can see that the period that the water would have gone over the levees was much shorter. When we did the calculations, we could show that flooding from water going over the levees uh, if there'd been no Mr. Go, it would have been a 50-fold less amount of water. Now, one of the documentaries that we, was mentioned in the beginning and, and one that uh, is really worth seeing is, is uh, The Big Uneasy by Harry Shearer, who's a com comedian, but very serious uh, documentary. And <clears throat> one of the people he interviewed said, if, if there'd been no levy failures, we would have been talking about wet ankles in the world. Now, the worst thing was, a lot of these failures occurred before the storm had even made landfall. 
And so there's an inner levy system in here. But what we're going to, sh what I'm going to show you is just how rapidly these flood waters move. The lower ninth ward is in the top corner here. You'll see those two breaches. Now you see that the model showing the water is filling up because it's raining. Okay, so we're filling it up with a little bit of water. And then uh, the clock's down there. And we're going to see uh, right around uh, six. Look at the, the levees breaching, 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 breaching. And then the lower ninth start going. Now just go over this, look how fast that's moving. Didn't even worry about the levee. People down here, when we interviewed, said it was a 10-foot wall of water that came through. 98% of the homes in this area were destroyed. Now, the Mr. Go and this area, the so-called funnel, we had been advocating for years that they should seal it because it was a funnel. I mean, we've been warning the Corps of Engineers through our modeling for a long time that this funnel was there. So we advocated, we had been advocating that they put a closure in. And we ran Katrina showing, you know, there's 18 to 20 feet of water in the funnel. And, but if you put, if you'd had the barrier, there would only be 10 feet. And you can see there's no water in these, this, don't worry about that. But in these areas, no water would have gone into the home. And the Corps of Engineers swore that we were wrong. Now, how do we sort out Louisiana? How, what is the key? How do, we, how do we try and save this area? As I mentioned in one of the first slides, the, the whole coast is built from the Mississippi changing its course with time. And that's happening. That's been happening since the mid 1500s down the Atchafalaya River. But of course, man has stopped it from doing this by putting in a control structure. But nevertheless, you can see these two deltas are forming on the coast. And, and when Hurricane Andrew came over this area, the, these two deltas and these very healthy wetlands, see it's all green, these very healthy wetlands knock down the wind energy. They, uh, so that 20 miles inland, the wind energy was 50% of what it was at the coast, and completely knocked down the surge. So this is the key, restoration, by diverting Mississippi River back into the wetland. And in fact, this little island here is called Ivers Island. This was my study area way back in 1977, and uh, I got to name the channels. And so I'm from Natal in South Africa, so this is Natal Channel. And somebody asked named the islands, and he named one of them Ivor. And it's actually on the, on the official state map. But, so, so what I wanted to do was to show if we, took, if we created one of those deltas in this area down here, where, where that big dome of water formed during Katrina, the dome that sunk Mississippi, what would it do? So we ran Katrina, we put a... We put a delta in there, and what we could show was a very marked reduction in the surge from 13 to 7, far less of a dome. And that's something, it's literally a case of blowing a hole in the wall. Just to stick a dynamo in the levee, and you can build a diversion. The next thing is the barrier islands. Now, they, they do have a project that's just started to try and restore the barrier islands our outer line of defense. And what we could show through the modeling with the Dutch was the big waves that form out at sea with, you know, with, with the hurricane, the 30-footers with 16-second periods, get knocked out completely by these barrier islands. They filter them out completely. And those are the most destructive waves. They also slow down the surge. They reduce the surge. So what we proposed was and this is a project we've been pushing since 1994 to mine sand from offshore and rebuild the barrier islands. So we ran the model, just making the islands a little higher, you know, a little higher and a little wider than they were. And I ran the storm that scared the hell out of the governor earlier. And what we did, we were interested in oil and gas infrastructure in this area around there called Homer. And what we could show was 
we could knock the surge with a $160 million project from 11 feet down to 9 feet. And the difference being that it wouldn't overtop the levees. They're now spending that money. Now, this trial was huge. The federal government spent millions. Uh, this, these lawyers that got together, eventually there were 28 of them, spent $11 million of their own money. And this was the judge's rule. And, and it's very strong. The court, Corps of Engineers, lassitude and failure to fulfill its duties resulted in a catastrophic loss of human life and property. The Corps of Engineers' negligence resulted in the wasting of millions of dollars and billions of dollars in protection. Um, and mentions the word, this kind of non-feasance. Now, the core, nothing's happened to the Corps of Engineers. Nobody's been fired. Nobody lost their job. Nobody had their pay cut. Nothing. They still go on. Um, this, this went to the appeals court, and initially the appeals court strengthened the ruling, and then all of a sudden, about six weeks later, they came back and said, this is a tort case, and they threw it out, and the Supreme Court uh, refused to hear it. So, so the whole thing was trying to get money uh, for the people. But this ruling still stands. The ultimate admission of guilt to us was the Corps of Engineers built the closure in the funnel that we'd advocated for so long. But they will still tell you it wasn't responsible for the flooding. Okay, so now we're going to come more locally. I was asked to, to look at uh, the northern neck. Whether you like it or not, sea level's on the rise. For whatever reason you may or may not believe, it's on the rise. And that's something we're going to have to deal with. In Louisiana, by 2010, the predictions are, as I mentioned, all the wetlands are going to be gone. Louisiana sinks up until recently, was sinking three feet every hundred years. So now you add on to that three feet of sea level rise, and we've already seen it start to accelerate in the Gulf of Mexico. So it means over the next hundred years, we're going to see six feet of a relative rise in sea level. Three feet from the ground sinking, three feet from the sea warming up and, and sea level rise. If you follow the six foot contour, it means all of this is underwater. And the majority of the, of the offshore oil and gas production, um, initial production facility. You see New Orleans will be an island. Now, if you look at some of the hazard maps, this is from the U.S. Geological Survey, you'll notice that in the Chesapeake, it's red just like it is in Louisiana. It's very vulnerable to sea level rise. If we go back through the data and look at Cap when Captain John Smith was around, sea level has risen, especially in the lower part of the bay, by three feet since he went around. And data, actual measured data that we have, shows that down in the lower part, we've got one, about one and a half feet every hundred years, and the upper part, about nine feet every hundred years. So it's happening because we are subsiding, just like Louisiana. We're just subsiding a little, a little slower. Now, if you add to that the different predictions for sea level rise, it's uh, depending on whether you take the accelerated or the high or whatever, the potential is to see about a five-foot rise over 100 years, even if it's only three feet. Remember that you now got more water for storm, storm surge, and your storm surge is on top of that. Now, before I bought my house here on House Creek, I went to, to Texas, because I can no longer run the models. LSU's banned me from everything. And I've got a friend of mine in Texas to run the model for my house, where I live, on Warehouse Creek. And he told me I could get 12 foot of water with a, with a severe cat four at my house. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of model data for this area. 
So I went and got some NOAA data. And this is for a Category 3 hurricane with a fairly high tide, two feet. But if you look around where we are, you'll see there's some greens and yellows and light blues. 9 to 12, in some areas, almost 15 for the search. That's for a 3. For a 4, it just looks a little worse. So this is, this is National Hurricane Center data. It's on the web. So I try to zoom in a little bit to our area, and you can see greens and yellows. Again, showing up to 16 feet of storm surge. Now, this is on a high tide. This is a Category 4. We only get a Category 4 maybe once every 80 years, as it was in the past. So, And then I look for other data, and this is how high the water will be above ground. And the blue is three feet up to three feet above the ground. And if you look there, right where we stand in, there will be three feet of water above the ground. There are, there is some, there's been a lot of work done. This is, a, uh, this is also, you can find this on the web, and it's uh, just trying to talk about shore protection. And you can see uh, the areas in brown, shore protection almost certain. So it's something for us to realize. We're not as badly off as Louisiana. But this is Tangier Island last September, just with uh, strong uh, southerly winds. It looks just like Louisiana. I mean, I can't believe. When I went the first time I went to Tangier, I said I, I've been transported back to Bayou country. Every time the tide's high, you get wet feet. So what are the lessons learned? The number one is, ignore the science at your peril. And I cannot stress this enough. I've now worked on a number of different projects around the world, and so often it's when the science has been ignored. Coastal systems are very dynamic. We tend to think of them as static. They've always been like this, but they change very rapidly. Hurricanes and northeast has happened. Coastal protection for, along most of our calc coast is inadequate, but there is a need to use nature. In Louisiana, blow some holes in the levees. You know, in this area, uh, maybe beneficial use of dredge material is one way to go. To try and enhance coastal protection. And government will not do it alone. That's the lesson from Louisiana. In Louisiana, um, some housewives got together and started something called levies.org. And it's run by a good friend of ours, Sandy Rosenthal. And she was a housewife. And she is a thorn in the Corps of Engineers' side. Right? Her and the rest of the housewives that worked with her. And against all opposition, they're now having parks. They, at each of the breach sites, they bought up the land and they're going to set up a park. So that it will be a permanent reminder. To, to what happened. So, so, you know, government, unfortunately, will not do it alone. So by way of conclusions, and this is a talk that I give to many universities, so it's a bit verbose, but we're going to see more coastal flooding. There's going to be need for more extensive levee systems, and we're going to have to approach hydrocarbon extraction very differently. Increases in precipitation, if you look at the models, many parts of the United States are actually going to get more rain. Okay. But other areas are going to be much drier. So you're going to change the rivers. And the rivers are what bring the sediment to the coast. So in some areas, we're going to increase the amount of sediment going to the coast. Other parts, we're going to cut it off. So it's, it gets to this dynamic nature. Sustainability may require some retreat from the immediate coast. It's already happening in Louisiana on its own. The coastal parishes are depopulated. Parts of Mississippi will never be rebuilt. People won't come back. Part of it's because flood insurance is getting so expensive, but part of it's because people are just tired of putting their lives back together. Now, for Louisiana, there's the BP oil spill, and there's going to be at least $10 million in funds. And those could be used to build diversion. 
But I can tell you right now, I spent part of this week responding to emails and writing long letters because there's a lobby against diversions developing, supposedly from some fishermen. Some say it's these big engineering companies that make more money out of rocks and concrete than out of diversions. I don't know. But, you know, you would think that after Katrina, it would be, people would understand you've got to do something. Since Hurricane Katrina, not one acre of wetlands has been built. But since Hurricane Katrina, we've lost another 100,000 acres. Most of it south of New Orleans. Now, what, one of the things I've tried to push when I, when I meet with, with uh, engineering companies or engineering conferences is if we can get it right in Louisiana, we're going to develop a lot of new technology that will make us the leaders and not the Dutch. You know, there's huge potential. Whenever there's change, whenever there's something like this, there's huge potential. That's what I tell the students. You know, I give this talk, talk similar to this all over the world, and I tell the students, we screwed it up, you're going to have to fix it. And, you know, this is an enormous opportunity. Are we up to the task? Now, if you need more information, I wrote a book. Uh, it's been picked up by a lot of universities, and you name it, All Ladies Knitting Clubs. And there's a very good uh, documentary by Harry Shearer, The Big Uneasy. And I do have a few copies of the book and a few copies of the, of the uh, DVD here if you're interested. Um, they're 15 bucks each. But with that, I want to I thank you for your time. And just let you know. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Oliver, you, you mentioned that the organizing theory for the protection of New Orleans was wrong and was flawed. And also that the monitoring and maintenance was flawed on there. Is, is there a, a single cause of that? A, a, a single reason for both of those um, disastrous flaws? Um, what, what we found was Congress was appropriating the money and, and, and quite often funding the Corps of Engineers to build the hurricane levees, but the Corps was siphoning the money off for navigation projects. They can do internal budget uh, uh, changes. So the money was actually getting to the Corps of Engineers and then being siphoned. This levee system, by the time Katrina hit, was 40 years old and large sections weren't even in place. I, 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 I've got too many pictures, but I could show you at Orleans Avenue, the walls just ended. Just like they just ended. <laughs> Before you even got to the end of the canal. So the water just didn't even have to worry about levees. It just flowed straight into the city. And we found many places where there were issues like that. So, so they were trying to do it cheap. That's part of the reason why we believe uh, that they used the, the, the lower standards for the hurricanes, because then they could build smaller and cheaper movies. Um, in terms of the 17th Street Canal, um, they had actually done a test, and the levee had failed, and they buried the test route. Before they built the 17th Street Canal, they, they did a test on the Atchafalaya River and it failed. And they just buried it. So, so even if... So, so even if the organizing theory for the protection had been correct, let, let's assume that, uh, there was no system in place to monitor and maintain the standards of that. Is that, is, was that true? Very much so, and I, and I, sh I, I should have addressed that. If you, if, if you build a, a, a skyscraper, you know, you're going to have a structural engineer do the, the engineering, an architect do it, but you're going to have an outside group to review it. 
whether it's done by the state, the city, or who else. They, there's going to be a review, and somebody's going to check the calculation. With the Corps of Engineers, there was no outside review whatsoever. And before Katrina, I'd had a number of, I'd had some previous run-ins with the Corps of Engineers, so they, they, they would never respond to any of my requests. So one of my graduate students um, requested some of the levy design information from me, and, and he even did a FOIA request. And they refused to, to give them up. And their response was, and it's in my book, these are Class A levies, they're not going to fail. Because we had seen some levies that did this before the storm. Claire? Economically speaking, why would they want to build navigation channels rather than levees? Um, they, be they believed that the Mr. Go was going to make uh, a lot of money for a lot of people. For the landowners along Mr. Go, who were going to build all these dock facilities and container ports and so on, which never got built. The, the, the pilots didn't want to use the canal because when you cut something like that, you change the tidal flows, and so they were having to deal with very strong tidal currents that, that flowed across the channel. Um, it, was, it was always shallowing. Um, the pilots much prefer to come up the Mississippi River, which has levees and protection, and when it's foggy, you can find your way up, and etc. So, so that. Mr. Go was never economically viable. But if, if everybody knows that uh, the land is sinking over there, why, did, why, is, why is anybody even building anything on that? Um, and why that's, that that's a very, very valid question. Yeah. Um, as I pointed out, about half of New Orleans is below sea level, half isn't. But there's an enormous amount of infrastructure there. The chemical plants, refineries, uh, businesses, the, the, a huge rail infrastructure, ports. It's the biggest port in the world. Between New Orleans and Baton Rouge is considered the biggest port in the world. So, so there's a lot of infrastructure. The, the Dutch, who looked at it, came out with a report and felt that they could give New Orleans 5,000 years worth of protection. They, they would totally change the, the way it's managed, the design. And they would also look at very rapid coastal restoration. So, so it's a, the potential is that it could be an island, but but it, if you there, there's along the that coast, there's no other really suitable deep uh, deep port. Um, and then if you ever fly between Baton, you know, south of New Orleans to north of Baton Rouge, there's chemical plant after chemical plant after chemical plant after chemical plant, and they all depend on the river. Plus the pipelines coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Well, so eventually they just take the chance. Well, I think what what we've seen is um, Texaco, for example, um, said we're not going to wait for anyone, and so they just spent uh, 230 million dollars beefing up um, their coastal structures you know, to to be able to withstand open ocean conditions. Mm -hmm. When you build a platform in a wetland, it's not designed for open ocean conditions with big waves. And that's what's been the problem. You know, after, after Katrina, just one of the oil spills was bigger than the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And there were about 100 oil spills. They never really got into the media. The biggest oil spill was 11 million gallons down, down near the mouth of the river. So, you know, the, the, the real scary part is a BP oil spill, as bad as it looked, was actually not that bad because the oil was being released over 100 miles offshore. And so when you actually looked at what was oiled on the coast, it was minimal. The number of birds and everything. Compared to the Exxon Valdez, it was, it was a much, much smaller a catastrophe. But if you have one of these major pipelines break in the marshes, you know, in Katrina, <clears throat> there were some oil tanks that floated. Okay. They never emptied them of oil. They floated 
and they moved three feet and sat down on, on the, the pilings. They have little pilings that are supposed to keep them from floating too far. And it ruptured, and they didn't know it ruptured. And 1,500 homes were totally dis were destroyed by the oil. That was near Charmaine. Question? Uh, well, my, my question is a little broader. I'm, I'm thinking about, you were showing some uh, pictures of, of uh, Tangier Island. Uh, we're talking about protection down uh, around New Orleans. So is there any type of um, cost ratio? I mean, at what point and at what point is it actually um, you know, uh, beneficial or, or, or from a cost perspective uh, to, to shore up these, these um, uh, you know, coastlines? Again, it depends what you're looking at. If you're looking at a very intense uh, industrial corridor with billions of dollars worth of infrastructure, then uh, you know, the cost ratio, it's easy to justify building fortress levies. And when you get to a community like, say, Tangier and, and, and in coastal Louisiana, if you imagine you've got 10 houses and they're worth $60,000 each, that's $600,000, but it's going to cost you $3 million to protect them by levy. What would? Yeah, not the houses. And that's, that thinking is now, it didn't used to be there, but that thinking is now permeating, certainly in, in Louisiana. And, and we actually have a law called the Coastal Zone Management Act of 1970, which says you cannot develop in the coastal zone where you would put people at risk from flooding and storm surge. It's been kind of pushed to the side, but there's now a group of legislators, uh, congressmen and senators who are starting to think about it. it's time we started to strengthen those laws. So, so. So we're going to have to retreat in some things. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tangier and, and New Orleans are kind of extremes. I'm thinking, you know, are there, are there some specific numbers um, that can be kind of guide for, for lawmakers and stuff like that so that when they make the decisions whether it's worthwhile to, to save a place or, or not or, or, you know, put legislation in place where that they cannot develop in this particular area, that they have something to fall back on? Well, the way it works is that Congress, through the Water Resources Development Act, grants the Corps of Engineers budget. And they can put stipulations in there. And so what they can do is order the, the, Corps, the Corps of Engineers to do a feasibility study. Let's say Tangier. What would be the feasibility? What would it cost to put a ringlet dike all the way around uh, Tangier? And then the Corps will do that feasibility study. Uh, and they will bring in some of other federal agencies, but generally they do it in-house, and they go back to Congress. Um, so there's, there's very little uh, chance for, for outside input, other than all feasibility studies require um, a public, um, require that you present the data to public, and there's a public comment period. And so, what scientists like myself, engineers in Louisiana, we would do, we would wait for the public comment period and then shove our reports uh, in and, and, uh, and give various, you know, legislators heads up that what was, what was coming. So um, the system has to change. We, we have to get more input, we have to get more science into it, um, you know, more chance for academics uh, and consulting companies to to get involved. Thank you.